We've been looking at the book of Joshua together. We're quite close now to coming to the end of our studies in Joshua. And um, today I want to talk about our inheritance. We're looking at chapter 14. I I sense the presence of God is really here this morning and he wants to do something in all of our lives. So just encourage you to be really open to the Holy Spirit as we look at this together. Chapter 14 says this. Now these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance to the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritance were assigned by lot to nine and a half tribes, as the Lord commanded Israel. And it goes on in verse 6. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report According to my convictions, but my fellow Israelites who went up with me made their hearts of the people sink. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and and of your children forever because you followed the Lord your God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years since that time. So he's now 85. The time he said to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness, so here I am today, 85 years old. That's not me, that's Caleb. I am still (laughs) as strong today. Hey, that wouldn't be a bad testimony though, would it, to look 50 and be 85? I'm still as strong as today as when Moses sent me out and I'm vigorous to go out to battle as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. You know, sometimes you have to take hold of the things that God wants you to have. They're not just going to drop in your lap out of a rainbow, then that's not going to happen. You have to take the land that God has promised you. And although God will fight for you, there's still something that you have to do. Essentially, walk wholeheartedly with God. And so this chapter and the chapters right up to chapter 19 talk about the inheritance, the things that God gave Caleb because he searched for him. The Israelites had come out of Egypt, as you know, out of their captivity. They were told by God to go and take hold of the land that was theirs, that was their inheritance, that God had promised to them. And yet they wandered around the wilderness, doubting God for 40 years. Unbelieving, not trusting. Do you know, it was interesting in that reading, one of the things it says there is... um, because of the bad report that the spies brought and the grumbling, that it made people's hearts sink. Sometimes we forget when we fail to trust God, when we talk negatively about our lives, we actually bring other people down with us. And we need to be very careful of that. They were, they were so despondent and so reliant upon Moses to cheer them up that when he was gone up the mountain fetching the Ten Commandments, do you remember they built an idol and worshipped that? And finally they got to the edge of the land that God had promised them. And Moses sent spies into that land to have a look at this amazing inheritance that God had promised them. But there were giants there. And so all but two of the spies came back very discouraged And they said they couldn't possibly take the land. But two spies, only two spies, came back with confidence that God was bigger. We've sung all about it this morning. Now we have to apply those words to our battles and our lives. In Numbers 14, I'm just going to pull out just a couple of verses to share with you. The people were saying, if only we died in Egypt. We've come all this way. What for? This isn't going to happen. There are giants in the land. We can't do this. 
Nothing, and you might have circumstances this morning and you're saying, it's gone too far now. My circumstances are worse than you can imagine. They cannot change. Well, I've got some very good news for you this morning. God is bigger than your problems, bigger than your battles, and he can do what no one else can do. And so the pe- while the people were crying, if only we died in Egypt, let's choose a leader and go back. We'll go back to Egypt, to the misery we had before. And Moses fell down on his face in front of the assembly. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, who were among them, who explored the land, they tore their clothes and they said, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give, us, give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. I want to t- remind you, because most of you already know this this morning, that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, and for some of us here, we did it for the first time many, many years ago, then something happens. God comes and lives in your life, and he never, ever, ever leaves you. He's with you forever, and he's promised to fight every battle. And even though you make mistakes, and we'll see this in a minute, in a couple of verses I will share with you, he still stays with you. Because it's not dependent on your fa- his presence, it's not dependent on your faithfulness, but on his p- faithfulness and his promises. I'll, I'll let me say this to you. Um, Moses pleaded with God. He said, "God, don't give up on these people." And there were repercussions because they didn't trust God. If you don't trust God, you don't get the inheritance and everything is planned for you. But he still is there. And it says in in verse 20 of this reading, I have forgiven them. I've actually forgiven these people for not trusting me. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and the glory of the Lord fills the earth, not one of them who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt, not one of them who disobeyed me, Not one of them will see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his inheritance, his descendants will inherit it. So God will, even when you don't trust God, he will never leave you. But if you want the very best from God for your life, You've actually got to trust him because then he'll give to you in response to your faith all the blessings that he has in store for your life. These people had seen so much of God's love and God's power and yet they didn't trust him. Caleb had been on a journey with these people. We estimate there were 2.5 to 3 million people who left Egypt on that journey when they escaped. They were slaves there in Egypt. And do you remember, I'm sure you've heard it in school, if nothing else, if you're old enough to have been taught Bible stories in school. The sea parted and the Israelites walked through on dry land. Three and a half, two and a half to 3,000 people were delivered by God. But only two of them entered the promised land that God had promised to give to them because only two of them trusted God and believed God. That's a, gosh, that's shocking, isn't it? And now it's 45 years later and Caleb is 85. There still would be opposition. There is always opposition. We we should never think, just because life is tough, that God isn't with us or God isn't for us. We all have difficult weeks. We all have struggles. Steve and I have struggles. All of us have struggles. But God has promised to bring us through. The terrain would be rough for Caleb. The enemies would be there and they would be strong and they would fight him. But God would give Caleb the victory. 
I wonder this morning if you know Jesus as your saviour. Have you made a decision to follow him like Caleb did? Just because you're sitting in church this morning, it doesn't make you a Christian. I've said it many times and other people have too. Sitting in a garage doesn't make you a car and sitting in a sweet shop doesn't make you a lollipop. (laughs) Sitting in a church, it's so important we get this, does not make you a Christian. Doing good works does not make you a Christian. Having a a mum or dad who went to church does not make you a Christian. God loves you so, so much. The Bible says he gave his son so that you could have life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would come to him could have life. All of their sins forgiven. The whole past just cleared out of the way as though it had never happened. And have a brand new start. And when you make that response and say, God, I really, really, I'm in that place now where I need you in my life. I cannot do this life without you. I've tried to make a success of it, but I fail and fail again. I'm miserable. God, if you are who you say you are, then come, come into my heart, come and change my life. I invite you in, I am sorry, as much as I can be. I I, I say sorry, Lord, that I have done things that have been wrong. Thank you that you died for that. Please forgive me and wipe the past out of my life and come and live in my heart. You can say that prayer today and I give you a guarantee that he will come because he loves you and he will change your life. I cannot guarantee you'll never have a problem ever again. In fact, I pretty much can guarantee you will have problems. But I can guarantee that God has a plan for your life, and he will make it better, and he will make you whole, and he will provide for you and give you things you never dreamt you could have, because he has an inheritance. Caleb came to this land because he had an inheritance. He'd walked through a wilderness for 40 years, but he kept trusting God and believing that God was bigger than his problems. What was it about, and I'm going to pray in a minute or two, if if you're not sure whether you're already a Christian, I'm going to pray, and we're going to say that prayer together and ask God to come into our lives this morning, because it's the most important decision you will ever, ever make. More important than getting a mortgage from the bank or getting a great job or having children or finding a husband. The most important decision in your life is asking Jesus into your heart because here and now you'll have a better whole life. And then when you one day, when you leave this planet, you have a promised home in heaven. Which, to be fair, is a lot better than going to hell, isn't it? Let's be honest about it. We don't like using that word in this day and generation, but that's where you go if you don't know Jesus. And that's, that's terrible. That breaks God's heart because he loves you. And he made heaven, he created heaven for you. So what was it about Caleb that made, him, made it different, that meant he could have what all the other people that left Egypt didn't have? It says in Numbers 14, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his inheritance will, uh, his descendants will inherit it. The Bible said he had a different spirit. Caleb believed God and he believed God's promises. If you're a Christian this morning, that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. If before, I don't know how, how, how successful you are at doing this, but I want to encourage you to believe God's promises for you and your life. So when we sing, you know, he's going to fight for us, he's going to remove the chains, he's going to open doors, then do we actually believe that? The other spies did not believe it. When they saw the giants and they saw the problems, they said, they confessed with their mouth, this is too difficult, let's go back to Egypt. But Caleb believed God. 
He said we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. There are always times, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to go into detail at all, but there are times we all feel like giving up, or most people do, or just for a split second, something happens and you think, this is tough. I had one of those moments this week. This is tough, Lord. Would it really be easier just to walk away? I only had it for a couple of seconds because obviously it's nonsense, isn't it? It's nonsense to think like that. If we walk away from God's promises for our lives, then that's a very foolish thing to do, however difficult a circumstance we might be in. So I'm not walking away. And neither, neither are you, are you? Because we're going to believe the promises that God has for us, even when things are tough. In Romans 8, it says, What shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against you? So if someone comes against you, it's not the time to say, This is too tough. I'm a sensitive soul. I can't cope. I'm a worrier. It's the time to say, God is for me. And that's enough for now because God will fight this battle. He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for me. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, present or future, or powers, heights or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So I'm encouraging you to believe the promises of God, even when it gets really tough, and just for a split second, it pos- the devil would whisper in your ear, wouldn't it be easier to walk away? Caleb chose faith over fear. I know I talk a lot about worry and fear, because Because God doesn't want us to worry and God does not want us to fear, even though it tends to be a very natural emotion that lots of us have. And Caleb chose faith over fear. And it's a choice, isn't it? Lord, I'm going to trust you. In Numbers 14, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land. That's an instruction. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. That's an instruction from heaven. We need Worship helps us to do that, you know. When we worship, we're confessing with our mouth the truth of who God is and how powerful he is and the fact that he's overall and he's reigning and he's reigning in our lives. And so that's one of the reasons worship is important. I go, as you know, I go into the Beacon Centre every week and I always make sure I spend 10 or 15 minutes with a, a gentleman called Bill in a wheelchair who's blind, an elderly gentleman. And um, we sing some hymns together in the corridor. Last week we sang Onward Christian Soldiers. I can't remember what else we sang, but they're all old hymns that he knows off by heart. And this week, I was walking down the corridor, and I'm, I, I thought, I'm, just, I'm not going to speak to Bill just yet. I'm just going to go and do something else, and then on my way back, I'll, I'll sit and I'll sing some hymns with Bill. But as I walked past, I, I looked at him. He obviously didn't see me. And he was in his chair, and he had a beaming smile on his face, and he was quietly singing a hymn all by himself encouraging himself in the Lord. Now, he has plenty he could moan about, stuck with no family in Beacon Court, completely blind, totally disabled. He has to be um, hoisted out of his chair whenever the carers are free to do that for him. He could easily be depressed. But you know what? He's chosen faith and he's chosen praise And he's chosen to believe that God is still with him. And his face was beaming. I left him there. I thought, I'll leave him to it for the time being. And then then we got back and and we, we sang a few hymns together, as we always do. 
2 Corinthians says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And worship is one of our weapons, declaring the goodness of God. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We have to take captive that fear. Take captive that moan. Take captive that state of poor old me. Poor old me. I was tempted this week. Poor old me. Poor old Shirley. I could write you a list of what, of what I'd put on it. I tell you what, I'm n- I refuse to do it. Even though I had, I, had the thought, I had the thought for the maximum of five minutes because I took my thoughts captive. It was my choice. And it's our choice to take our thoughts. God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. If you want a sound mind this morning, if your mind is struggling, then come again fresh to Jesus. Caleb also believed God. He had faith. Faith? Now then, you can't have faith in what you've already got. If, if Steve gives me, I don't know, £100 <laughs> later on today, it's, oh, I really appreciate you this week. It is £100, surely then I don't need faith for that, do I? Because I've already got it. You need faith for that which you haven't got, but you're believing God for. I'm not... (laughs) 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 Sowing seeds, you never know. (laughs) I'm joking, that's not true. I'm not believing for £100. The card says it all, doesn't it, from his Father's Day card. So instead of fear, Caleb chose faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance what we do not see. So we actually say to God, Lord, everything's a mess, but I'm going to believe that you're going to turn it around. That's what faith is. In fact, faith is so important that Hebrews 11 says it's impossible to please God without faith. So you can do all the acts of goodness you want to do. If 1 Corinthians talks about it, doesn't it? Give your body to be burned, give all your money away. But if you do not have faith, you don't even please God at all. We have to believe God if we're going to please him and make him smile. Caleb also knew, and I'm going to do this quickly, we need to pray together. He knew that you got, you've got to keep going. It's called Perseverance. 45 years, he persevered until he got to that place where he was in the promised land and he got his inheritance. And it was only him and Joshua that got it. He persevered. You need to persevere, Hebrews 10, so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Do you know what? God has things for you in this world to bless you, as well as heaven in the next. But you have to persevere. You can't give up. It's worth persevering because who's going, to, who's going to fight the battle for you anyway? God is. Zechariah, it says, it's not by might. It's not, so it's not by your might this is going to turn around. It's not by your power this is going to turn around. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. I am going to turn around. This is not about having a positive mental attitude. This is not about mindfulness, the new rage in the church that's arising today. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with walking down and feeling the tree and saying that's nice, isn't it? But that's not what we do here. That's how the world deals with with improving our minds. We have a God who transforms us by his spirit. And he tells us to meditate on his word. That's just my take on mindfulness, which is... I've noticed a rising in church these days. Caleb was totally surrendered to God. God has plans for you. Did you know that? One of the things that often breaks my heart is when I see Christians who have had dreams and ambitions for God and somehow it's just not happened. It can happen if we believe God 
if we persevere, if we trust him. Ephesians says, and Rita mentioned this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance for the saints. God has a plan for you. Let's pray together. I want to pray um, for those of us who already know the Lord, that he will help us to persevere, that he will strengthen us, that he will fill us with his spirit and help us to trust him, that we will get the very, very best like Caleb did in this world of God. We don't want to scrape into heaven, do we? We haven't had a miserable life. We want to go knowing that God has given us many, many, many good things and used us for his glory. Lord, I pray for my fellow brothers and sisters. Help us to run after you as Caleb did, like we have never run after you before, Lord. Help us to be steadfast when we feel like giving up, Lord. We're going to determine today, here and now, that we will press on, that we will trust you, that we will exercise our faith over our fear, And we will declare, if God is for me, who can be against me? Would you pour in great things into my brothers and sisters this morning? We know that you have plans for us, work for us to do. And we want, Lord, to serve you. Help us, Lord, we pray. And Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who just needs to make that first step. Would you pray? It's not a a clinical prayer. There's lots of ways you can pray it, but I want to pray the type of prayer that will help you to make that relationship with God. And I ask you, if you need to do that today, you will pray it now in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for bringing me to this place today. I believe it is you that has brought me here because you love me. I don't understand everything, but I do know that Jesus died for me on the cross because he loves me. Would you forgive me for every wrong thing I've done? I want to be your friend. I want you to be my saviour and my Lord. I give you my broken life, and I pray, God, that you will just put it back together Would you come now and live in my heart? Turn my life around. I give you all of my problems. I can't sort them, but I'm told that you can. So, Lord, I give you my problems today, and I'm praying for a miracle. I'm going to choose to believe, Lord, that you can change my life and that you want to bless me. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, it's really important that you speak to one of us, a friend or Steve or I or somebody you know here, because we have booklets that we can give you to help you on your journey. But if you have, it's the best decision. And if you didn't say that prayer, but you want to pray with us, we will pray with you. Bless you.